Amen. Let's keep praying that. Let's let peace, the peace of God that transcends all understanding, rule our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And faith rise up. May fresh faith rise up. The Bible teaches that faith is a gifting. So, Lord, we're asking, would you impart fresh faith to us this morning? A new measure of faith, a, a new grace, God, to believe you are who you say you are and that you're going to do everything you promised that you would do. I pray for my friends and family this morning that are here, that they uh, would be discipled by you, Holy Spirit, that you would open the eyes of our hearts as we look into your word and that you would speak to all of us and that we would leave different because we've met with you and only you can change things. We agree, God, that you want to move, that you are moving in our lives. And we say, yes, have your full way in us. Dream your dreams in us, God, and through us. I want you guys to take a minute, just extend a hand toward me and just ask God to bless me so that I don't mess up, make a mess of church this morning. Go ahead. God, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Give somebody a pound or an elbow or a wave, whatever you feel comfortable with, before you sit down. Good morning, everyone. We're going to have a good morning today, I believe. Uh, Gabe um, calls these pants of mine my Holy Spirit fire pants. And so we're going to have a Holy Spirit fire party this morning, I believe. May it happen every Sunday morning that we get together. Amen. But we're starting a new series this morning entitled The Process of a Promise. The Process of a Promise. You know, the Word of God teaches us that over 4,000 times, God speaks to His people and gives His people promises. And how many of you know that when God makes a promise, it's going to happen? When God makes a promise, it will happen. And I'll tell you something a little bit about my, uh, the family that I grew up in. We love laughing and like joking around all the time, and we like fooling one another. And one of the ways that we fool one another is, to be honest, it's the bottom line, is we lie. We'll be deceitful. Not to be deceitful, but to, like, to get a trick on somebody. And so the other uh, week ago, my sister and her husband uh, texted us and said, hey, um, we were driving through Baton Rouge, and we started to stop, but um, we knew that y'all just got back from a trip and probably were tired. And I texted back, yep, you're right, we were tired. Thank you for not stopping. And she lives in Arkansas, so, and, but I knew she was lying. And, but her family has this deal that they say, if you don't say, I promise, you can say anything and it's not a lie. But, you know, whenever you're with her family, the one thing they say all the time is, do you promise? Do you promise? Do you promise? But we love to play tricks. She, uh, my family had had a little illness this last couple of weeks, and she texted last night and said, hey, are you, all of y'all better? And I said, yeah, everyone but Briley, um, but, and Brian probably can't respond to the text because she's at the hospital with Briley. And I knew she wouldn't believe me, so I, I texted Brian. I said, Brian, you have to tell Cassie, wait, just to, I'll text you back in a minute. The nurse is in here right now. And she said, you're lying. So it's just a game that we play all the time. But God doesn't play games with us. He makes promises, and he keeps all of his promises. And we're going to talk about how God promises us things. And what does it mean? We're going to look at different characters in the Bible this morning. We're going to look at Abraham. But God makes promises to us. And there's a few things that we're going to learn this morning about his promises. You know, at different seasons of our lives, we all have different desires. When I was in high school, uh, when I was in middle school, I wanted to be the funniest kid. When I was in high school, I wanted to be the most popular kid. When I went to college, I wanted to get married more than I wanted a degree. You know, I remember the college we went to, they would joke around and say that a lot of girls come here to get an MRS degree. And I thought, well, I'm here to get an MR degree, you know. Um, and did not have that promise that I was hoping for a promise was, that was not fulfilled for me. Part of the reason it wasn't fulfilled for me is because I did not have the maturity yet. I was not far enough along in my spiritual formation to enter into a covenant uh, with my wife, you know. Um, many of us, we go to college, we want a promise. God, what do you want to do in my life and through my life and want to get that great job and climb the ladder? And I want us to know that God is a promise-keeping God. But everything that we want to do all the time is not necessarily a promise that God's making. 
But if God speaks to us and makes a promise, he's going to fulfill that promise. In the summer of 1995, I saw the movie Braveheart. And during Braveheart, there was a point where um, the, the, the William Wallace's uh, parents died, and there was a funeral. And at the end of the funeral, this little girl went over and picked up, a, picked a flower off the ground, out of the ground, and took it over to him. And we know that it's called what? Foreshadowing. Now, what was the foreshadowing event? That he was going to marry her one day. And I believe in that moment, the Spirit of God spoke to me, and he said, you're going to know your wife one day because she's going to pick you flowers. And I thought, Lord, is that you? And, or not, you know? And I, had, I dated a couple of girls before I finally married my wife, and I really wanted them to pick me flowers. I would even hint to them to pick me flowers. And they never got the hint. Now, I'm going to tell you, I loved, in, in, as a child, I would work with my dad in the vegetable garden. I'd work with my mom in the flower garden. I love flowers. If you think that makes me a sissy, I'll punch you in the face, you know. God made flowers, and I like them, you know. Well, Brian and I started dating, and we were at a youth retreat, and uh, we were on our way to dinner after a, after a guy spoke. And we're on our way to dinner, and she uh, leaned over, and I thought she dropped something. And, y'all, she picked a flower and gave it to me. And that... I believe, was a, f- a foreshadowing, a part of the, a promise from God. Now, what if she picked the flower and we broke up? You know, here's the reality. The Bible says that we hear in part, and we know in part. And so, I'm going to believe God wholeheartedly for any promises that he gives me. But I want to have the humility to carry it with my hands wide open. Because whatever promise that he wants to give us, it is for our good, but it's also for the good of many other people. And I'm a lot better as a pastor because God gave me Brianna. And our family's a whole lot better. I mean, I was thinking about her this morning. And she picks flowers every day at our house. And what I mean by that is prophetically, she brings in the fresh life of God every day in our house. And our kids can tell you that. She is the one that keeps us focused and and diligently pursuing God, bringing the word of God. She picks flowers every day so that others can be filled and fed. And we're all called to that, right? We're all called to that. And so, you know, here, here's another th- way I want to say this. Uh, we're, we're, there's two ways that we're going to live our life in God. If we're not living our life in God, we're just living our life here, doing whatever we want to do, trying to be successful or whatever. But there's two ways that we'll try to live our life from God, in God. We'll either live in a way that we're kind of on earth toward heaven. Or we can live from heaven toward earth. Now, what do I mean by that? In the Old Testament, uh, they, the, the Hebrew people were given the covenant of God. They were given the Ten Commandments. And they believed that their righteousness was based on what they did. But in the New Covenant, we learn that our righteousness is not based on what we do. It's based on what Jesus did for us. And so, you know, if you've ever experienced the word of the Lord, he's spoken to you about something, you believe the word, and you obeyed the word, something then happened in someone else's life. I I can tell you, I don't know how many times people have come up to me and said, hey, Donnie, do you remember when you said this to me? And I'm like, no, I don't. You know, and they're like, that word changed my life. And I don't remember it because it wasn't me. It was the spirit of God in me. But I believed and I responded in faith and it opened up a way for someone else. You know, but if I just go to them And I kind of thump them over the head with the Bible and say, don't do this and don't do that. And, you know, I'm living from earth to heaven. When I'm trying to make things happen on my own strength, I'm living from earth to heaven. But as believers, we are called to live from the place of heaven to earth. And Jesus, everywhere he went, people's lives got changed because he lived from this perspective from heaven to earth. I'll illustrate it here just another way. In the book of Ephesians, we're going to talk about this a little bit more next week. In the book of, the, of Ephesians, there's um, three little metaphors that the Apostle Paul gives us. Let me come over here. No, let's come right here. Three metaphors that Paul gives us. Uh, in Ephesians 2, he says that you are seated with Christ woo, in heavenly places. You're seated with Christ in heavenly places. In Ephesians 2.10... A couple verses later, he says this, that we are God's workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared in advance for us to walk in. In Ephesians 4.1, he says, walk in a way worthy of the calling that you've received. And then toward the end of the book, we'll talk about this more next week, he says, when the devil comes against you, take your stand. Take your stand. So there's different seasons in our life, in our walk with God. Some seasons, we're sitting. Some seasons, we're walking. And some seasons, when the enemy's coming after us, we just, we're just standing. We're just standing, waiting for God to deliver. And I think this is a great picture, like, we'll probably go with this, of what it means to live from heaven to earth. That first, we're seated in Christ Jesus. And we're seated with Christ Jesus. And, you know, having a quiet time is not something that we check off. I don't want to read my Bible and say a few prayers um, just for the sake of reading my Bible and saying prayers. That's living from earth to heaven. I want to be seated in Christ because I am. And I want to be seated with Christ because he knows what's about to happen during the day that I don't know. I want to be seated with Christ so that I'm not getting frustrated about my wife or my job or my kids thinking about I wish they would do this or do that or do this because really the only thing that matters to me is God what are you doing and I want to be seated with him so I can know what he's doing and then when I walk I want to I know that God you prepared good good works for me to walk in today me and you there are good works there are things that that we've not discovered yet in our day There are opportunities that he's going to give us today to live from heaven to earth and to bring the kingdom of heaven into earth as Jesus prayed. May it be, uh, as it is in heaven, let it be in earth. As it is in heaven, let it be in Baton Rouge. As it is in heaven, let it be uh, as we go to lunch today. As it is in heaven, let it it be uh, that saints be be the bears. As it is in heaven, you know. And this is where we're called to live, at a place of being seated with Christ. So that he's telling us what's going on. He's showing us who he is. And he's speaking to us about who we are. And from there, we walk into those good works. We walk a life that's worthy of the Lord, worthy of the calling that we receive from him. Not, by, not on our own strength, but by his spirit. We walk in love because we want to be imitators of the Father, as it says in Ephesians 1 and 2. Are you with me? So God gives all of us promises. Like I said, over 4,000 promises are found in the scriptures. No, I said that wrong. 7,487 promises from God to his people in the scriptures. I read this story this week that's super cool. Uh, the Toronto War Museum tells us the story of a 19th century man uh, named, his Indian, Indian man, he was known as Crowfoot. And he was chief of the uh, Sika Indian tribe, and he was known for his peaceful relations with Canada during the time of great violence, during the Indian Wars. And when the Canadian Pacific Railroad was being built, and they needed part, uh, part of it on his land, the Canadian government approached Crowfit with an offer. They said, if you'll give us this land that we need for a railroad, you can ride on it whenever and wherever you want. They actually paid him for part of it, and they said, you can ride on it. And so he said, absolutely, let's just do it. And so they made this deal. They finished the Canadian Pacific Railroad, uh, and Crowfit received this lifetime pass. And they, but when they gave it to him, they put it in this beautiful case. And, and, and Crowfoot wore this every day of his life. He wore this, 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 uh, this pass um, to ride anywhere he wants on this train uh, around his neck, in this case, every day of his life. But there was just one problem. As far as we know, Crowfoot never stepped foot on the train. He never left his land. He never went anywhere. And I think that's a picture of us a lot of times as Christians. Like Crowfoot, we possess promises from God. And we might quote them. We might put them in a nice little frame somewhere in our house. We might, you know, tell others about them, hang it on the walls, uh, even post it on social media. But we never actually make use of them. See, as believers, people who walk with him, who keep in step with the Spirit, just like Joshua. He said, Joshua, wherever you step, I'll give you every place you place your foot. We have this lifetime pass to execute the kingdom of heaven. We are not bound by the things that we see. 
We're not bound by the finances that we see in our bank account. We might be discipled to be better stewards, but we can also believe that God is going to provide for us because he's our provider. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. And the way that we see things right now is, is not always the reality from God's perspective, which is why we need to be seated with him morning by morning. God, what are you say? How do you see things? God, what are you saying? God, what are you doing? Because I want to do what you're doing. I want to do whatever you are doing. You know, I want to look at, look at Abraham's life this morning. Genesis 12, 1 through 4. It says, the Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. I'll make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord told him. Now here's something interesting. God didn't just make this promise to Abraham saying, go to this place. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a promised land. It's going to be a land that I give you one day. The first thing he says is you can't stay where you're at. You can't stay here where you're at. And now to understand the context, in Genesis 11, this little story that happens right before this that we're reading today, uh, Abram was with his father. And he was one of three sons. And he had a brother named Haran who had a, who had a son named Lot. And at some point before the father died, Haran passed away. His son died. And I cannot imagine a greater pain than losing a child. Well, they left the land that they were living in, and they end up in this city. And this city was known, was named Haran. And there was something about being in this city named after the son that he lost that just provoked him to grief. The Bible says in the, in, in the book of Proverbs that, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And he settled in this place of his grief. And God said, I don't want you to do that. You know, because he was supposed to go to Canaan. It was his father's calling and destiny to go to Canaan. But he settled in another place. He settled in this place of grief. So then God speaks to Abraham and says, don't stay here. Leave. And go to the place that I'm going to show you. Now, it's easy to miss how significant this is. Because in, the, in this day, in, the, in that time, land, family, and inheritance were among the most significant elements or values of that ancient society. Land, family, inheritance. So land inher- and inheritance. You know, farmers and herders, land was their livelihood. But for the city folks, uh, it wasn't their livelihood, but it re- represented their political identity. Where they stood on the social ladder. Based on the lands that they had and how much land that they had. Family and descendants was important because it represented their future. You know, as, as parents uh, would care for their uh, aging, uh, I'm sorry, as, as children would care for their aging parents um, so that the, the family line would extend to another generation. So the father, the, the, the leader of the household, he would own the property. He would own the estate. But he would work with his sons and daughters uh, to care for the estate, to make money through the estate. And usually right before he died, he would impart a blessing specifically to the oldest son who would become the new leader of the household. And so we see here, and they would even give proper burials, and they would bless their their parents who were dead because they believed that that would give them a a hope in a greater afterlife after that. So through this, we learn that when Abraham left his father's household, he gave up his place in his father's household. He forfeited his security, which was his inheritance. And he was given up his identity and inheritance and right to his family's property. He was putting his survival, his identity, his security, and his future in the hands of the Lord, Yahweh. You get what I'm saying? He left it all behind. Everything that gave him identity, security, a significance, and a future. He left it and he trusted the Lord. And that's a good thing for all of us to do. Because look, again, the Lord says, go, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Don't worry about your property. You're going to be more than a landowner. You are going to be a nation. I'm going to bless you. Your name will be great. Don't worry about leaving your father's household where you are to be the next head of the household. Because I'm going to make your name great. 
I will bless you. And I will bless those who bless you and I'll curse those that curse you. And so Abraham responded appropriately. He obeyed the Lord. So there's a few things here that we learn about promises. And I'm going to take a drink of water. There's five biblical characteristics of promises from God. Number one is a promise starts with God. It's not a good idea that we have. It's a God idea. It starts with God. And he initiates with us, his, his servants, his followers, he initiates with us, and he'll give us a promise that's a much bigger idea, than, a better idea than we could have ever thought of. So a promise starts with God, and with his promise is his presence. He says, I will be with you. As a matter of fact, the greatest commandment that, that's found the most throughout from Genesis through Revelation is this. Fear not because I am with you. And so when God gives Abram this promise, it was God's idea and God was with him. We see that because in the very first verse of, of chapter 4, it said, and the Lord spoke to Abram. And the Lord spoke to him. So he, the, number two is he'll be with us. Uh, number three is it's impossible. The promise cannot be fulfilled Unless God does it. It's impossible apart from the Lord. So if you get a promise from God that you can accomplish on your own strength, it's not a God promise. Because he's made us to be utterly dependent on him. If you can fulfill it, it's, it's a, it might be a good idea. But it's your idea. Not a, God's, God, not a God idea. God wants to give us promises that we cannot fulfill apart from him. Number four, our part in the promise is this. We believe what God says, and we do the next thing that he tells us to do. We obey. Now, that's a hard word uh, for a lot of us in our independent world and culture, you know, but we are called to be dependent on God. And when we obey him, the kingdom happens. It may not be a miracle where a blind person sees. However, it may be a, a miracle and a blind person sees. It may be through going to lunch and giving a huge tip to, your, to whoever's serving you. Because they've got a need that they prayed for this morning. I've got a, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. But we're there at lunch. We're seated with Christ. Jesus, how much am I supposed to get? Holy Spirit, what, what would you have me give today? And he tells us, and we do it, and heaven happens. We're living from heaven to earth. Abram was living at this point of his life. Now, he didn't have good days like this every day. We'll talk about that more next week. But on this day, he was living from heaven to earth. God said, you can't stay here. Leave, and I'm going to show you where I want you to go. So number four is our part is only to believe and obey. And number five is you will be cared for and provided for, but the promise is to, while it blesses you, it will bless many other people. So he'll promise us something that we'll be blessed by, but it's also to bless a whole lot of other people. We put it another way. The promise isn't all about you. And the promise isn't all about me. God's all about me. God's all about we. But the promise is about blessing others. And God gets glorified in it. Okay. I want to look at another uh, portion of scripture here. In Genesis 15. In Genesis 15. 1 through 5. So after this. Uh, he just got in a battle in chapter 14 by trying to save his nephew Lot. Uh, it says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. So now he's speaking to, to Abram in a different way. The first time he's just speaking to him like one man speaks to another. Hebrews, talks, Hebrews 11 talks about how uh, Abram and James talks about how Abram was a friend of God. But now he's going to speak to him in a different way. He, it says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Uh, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. Now, that makes a whole lot more sense now that we know that when we live in a place, when they lived in a place with, with property, uh, with their family, there was a place of protection. And he left his comfort zone and went to a place that he didn't even know where he was going. But he says, don't worry about it because I'm your shield. I just took care of you in that last little battle in chapter 14. I'm your shield. And you know what? Your daddy's farm isn't your great reward. I am your great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one will, who will inherit my state is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. 
So a, a couple of things. Uh, you know, when God spoke when about what he's about to speak, well, I'm going to wait for that, okay? So let's hit two things as we just re- read this. A vision. A vision is the word of the Lord or the message from the Lord came through a vision. He saw a picture, you know, and, and God was communicating to him through that picture. In the Old Testament, these were mostly, these visions were mostly given to the, to the prophets. And, and visions may be experienced in a dream, uh, but not only. It's not the same thing as a dream. Uh, they may be visual or it may be auditory. Uh, it may be revealed through natural uh, creation, or it may be revealed through supernatural. Like in the book of Revelations, there's a ton of supernatural uh, pictures of what God intends for us. You know, but the individual having the vision, he may be a, an observer of the vision, but he also might be a participant. And in this case, he was both. And so when we, when God gives us a vision for something, a clear mental portrait of a foreseeable future that he's communicating, that we're to be a part of, uh, it might be for us, but it might be for someone else. And so when I ask God to give me a word, what is it that you would like for me to say to this person? God, what are you saying? How do you see things? A lot of times he will give me a picture. And I'll share the picture, and I'll say, I'm not sure what it means, but I have a hunch that it might mean this for you. Does that make sense? And they're like, yes. Maybe laughing or maybe crying because the Spirit of God's on it. Okay, so number two is, is this whole thing about the inheritance. As a servant will receive my inheritance. Uh, if the head of the household had no male heir, they would legally adopt a servant to be their heir. And so we can see Abram's frustration and him telling God, am I supposed to adopt Eliezer or what? Am I just going to die and you're just going to give it to him? I don't know what to do right now with this promise that you've given me. Well, he wasn't supposed to do anything at that point. He was supposed to still be seated, seated. Not standing, not walking, but seated. Because then God takes the the word a little bit further. Verse 4, chapter 15, verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky. And count the stars. So now he's, the vision is, is through a natural means. Look at, the, look at the sky. Count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So again, he's walking with him. He says, get up. Now let's walk outside. Walk with me. Look up there. You're not going to have to adopt this servant. I'm going to give you a son. And remember, the second part of a promise is it's impossible for us to do. Apart from God's help. Abram was 75 years old. It was impossible for him to have a son. He was 75 years old. And he's frustrated because it hasn't happened yet. And you know what? In reality, it took 25 years. God spoke to him when he was 75 that you're going to have a son. But it wasn't until he was 100 years old till he had that son. And sometimes God will speak a promise to us. God spoke a promise to me in 1993 that, that I just started living out about four years ago. There was a process. We're going to talk more about that next week. And so now God's going to go further, and he's going to, do, he's going to ratify the covenant. What does ratification mean? It's an action of making the covenant officially valid. So 15, 7, and 8. So again, the problem, actually number two of the promise is he's with us. And so God's walking with Abram. And he said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans. So again, It's God who's doing this. I brought you out of Ur Ur of the Chaldeans to give you the land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I'll gain possession of it? So the Lord goes on. He says, bring me a heifer, a ram, a goat, uh, some doves, and a a pigeon. And then he says, I want you to do this. So can you imagine having a quiet time with God? That's That's what's happening right now. He's spending time with God. God says, take these animals, the, the, the heifer, the goat, uh, and the ram, and cut them in two. Now, that would be hard to fall asleep during that quiet time, right? So he has this quiet time. He, he sacrifices these animals, which is a form of worship. He sacrifices these animals, and he divides them. So there's just a bloody mess everywhere. And then this, this thing that happens, he goes on and he tells him the word of the Lord. He says that one day you are going to live where you're at right now. This is going to be your land and your descendants that are going to be more numerous than the stars in the sky. Are, they're going to start out in this land. 
They are going to be in Egypt for 400 years, but I'm going to deliver them from there, and I'm going to bring them to the promised land. And, and it's going to happen. And so Genesis 15, 17, 18, a really strange thing happens. He says, when the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, uh, right before this, Abraham is out. He just goes out, and the Lord has this vision. The sun had set, the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces of the carcasses that were torn in two. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. So again, we see that God spoke the promise. Abram, you don't think you have a son. I'm going to give you a son. Okay? I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to do it because you're going to be 100 years old and it's going to be impossible. But, but I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to give you a son and I'm going to be with you all along the way. I'm going to be with you. And, and you, all you have to do is obey and believe. And that this promise is going to bless the whole world, like he said in 12. The whole nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you. So why, what, what does all this stuff mean? Well, well, the smoking fire pot was like a small oven that they would cook grain in for, 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 to sacrifice grain before the Lord. And, and the, the, the flame that was on top of it represented a few things. It, was, it represented cleansing. It represented judgment. And it represented Yahweh, the presence of the Lord. And so he shows up now in the form of this smoking fiery pot and this flame. And he goes between the animals. He's walking back and forth between the animals. And what is he saying by, by this? He's saying, Abram, if this covenant that I've made with you is not fulfilled, may it be done unto me as it's been done to these animals. If this covenant is not fulfilled. You know what? God fulfills every covenant. He fulfills every single covenant. But this is a beautiful picture of the gospel. Because later on, God gave another covenant to Moses, known as the Mosaic Covenant. And he, he told them, guys, if you obey these ten things, I'll be your God, you'll be my people, and you'll prosper. But the people broke the covenant. They didn't maintain the covenant. In Jeremiah 31, we see that God says, I'm going to give you a new covenant. And in that covenant, my word's not going to be on the outside of you where you try to obey it on your own strength, where you try to live from earth to heaven. It's going to be on the inside of you. It's going to come down and rest on your head and burn in your heart. And, you know, covenants don't go away. And so God, through Jesus, dealt with the covenants. Just as those animals' body was torn in two, Jesus was torn in two. Jesus died on the cross to fulfill the covenant, to fulfill the old covenants. And made this new covenant with us by giving us the spirit. So through his death, we're not just forgiven. We've been recreated. Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians 5 that we're a new creation. And it's not just individually, but we're a new creation in a whole new realm. Now we get to live from heaven to earth. Are you with me? This is our identity as children of God. We are co-heirs with Christ. Everything that's his is ours. So when we live from heaven to earth, we fulfill what Jesus said in John 12 where he said, you've seen the things that I've been doing, you're going to do greater things than, than these. Because of the spirit of God living in us, enabling us to live from heaven to earth. So a promise starts with God. You know, as we start to close, uh, just a couple more things before we close. Um, what does this mean for us? Has anyone here ever had a promise? From God that hasn't yet been fulfilled. Proverbs 13, 12 says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. Abram's dad, his hope was deferred. And he was sickened in heart. And he stopped before he got to the promised land. You know, beloved, I want you to know God has promises for your life. That, that's his idea. Not just a good idea. It's a God idea. That he's going to be with you. That you can't fulfill it apart from him. All you got to do is believe. Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. All you got to do is believe and obey. And as you are walking with him. And obeying in him. Living from heaven to earth. Not earth to heaven. Heaven happens. Heaven happens. You know I, I would imagine that, that many of us ha have promises that God's given us. That we've not received yet. 
And we may be sick in heart because our hope's deferred. I just want to encourage us that God wants to wake up your heart this morning and remind you of the promise. And you know, one of the reasons why we need church, we need people around us that remind us of the promises of God. That speak into our lives things that they didn't know God already spoke to us about. Because there is a process. And the promise doesn't always happen like fast food. It rarely does. It rarely does. But God has promises for all of us. We may have individual promises that God spoke that's not fulfilled. You may have a promise regarding your marriage or different relationships or some of your children that you've not seen God fulfill yet and your heart's getting sick. I just want to tell you that if God promised it, it's going to happen. And we want to believe with one another. We want to lock arms. You know, this church is here today because God spoke a promise to a group of people that were going to school at, at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. But you want to know what happened before that? God spoke a promise to people who lived in this city, and they agreed with the promise. They prayed, God, bring a church like this church to this city. One of those people who prayed that, it's her birthday today, Miss Edie. Happy birthday, Miss Edie. Thankful to God for her. But, you know, the launch team, they got here, they experienced God, and part of that, they were standing on the shoulders of people who interceded before they ever got here. And I'm here today because a long time ago, people started praying for a church like this. A launch team came that I wasn't a part of. Then God took a while, but he spoke to Brian and I together that we're to be a part of this. And so we here today, we're standing on the shoulders of the launch team who's standing on the shoulders of people who prayed this church in. You know, next month, we get to enter into a house that's going to become a home that's going to facilitate God's work in the city and the nations of the earth because God promised it. Because God promised it. And I believe that God has spoken to us that we're to be a church for the whole city. But you know what? That's not happening yet. And it's not my business to make it happen. It's my business to believe, to pray, and to obey the next thing God calls me to do. That's our response. I think it's summed up in 2 Corinthians 1, 20 through 21. This is the last point. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, through Christ, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it's God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He's anointed us. So what does that mean? The word amen is a remarkable word. It was transliterated directly from the Hebrew into Koine Greek. And from the Greek New Testament, then into Latin, then into English. And many other languages as well. It's practically a universal word. It's called, it's been called the, the most well-known word in the human speech. And the word is directly related. It's almost identical to the Hebrew word believe. The Hebrew word believe is aman. And so amen means, it partially means believe or faithful. And thus, it, it, it means, you know, that this is surely, this is sure, this is true, this is going to happen. It's an expression of absolute trust and confidence. When one believes God and indicates their faith by an amen, then God, that when God makes a promise, our response is amen. So another way to put it is, God makes a promise and we say, yes, sir, I'm in. I'm in. You promised it. You're going to do it. I'm with you. Make it happen, God. Because only you can. Only you can make it happen. And when we pray according to his word and his will, we know that God will answer. And that's why we close with amen. So shall it be. Do it, God. So shall it be. And that's our response. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes. And so through him and through us the amen is spoken god you promised it we believe it we're in what do we do next i want to invite everyone to stand i think there are probably at least two groups here this morning some may be here and you feel like you've never heard a promise from god I want you to know if you're a child of God, if you're a follower of Jesus, he has promises for you. Even if you are not following God yet, he's got promises for you. Because he made you in his image and he made you on purpose for a purpose. 
So some of us may not have, have not received or heard a promise that's clear to us. Others of us may be in here this morning and we've received a promise, but it's not happening. We're still in the process, which we're going to talk about next week. It's going to be fun. We're still in the process, but it's not happened. And I'm, I'm starting to, my faith is starting to wane a little bit. And I'm discouraged. If either of those describe you, we're going to do ministry time a little different. I just want you to walk down here and just stand. Just walk down here and stand. You've not received a promise or you've not seen it fulfilled and you're getting a little discouraged. Don't worry about people looking at you. People aren't really thinking about you. They're thinking about where do I fit there, God? Okay? If you've been in a place where you've not seen a promise fulfilled, don't wait. Just run down here. The quicker you get down here, the quicker we're going to believe God for you, the quicker we'll get to lunch. You've either not heard God promise, God's promise, or it's not been fulfilled and it's starting to get a little discouraging. I think there are probably more. And so feel free at any time. We're going to sing this song. And as you're here, if you have not received a promise, I just want you to ask God, God, would you speak a promise to me? God, what is the thing that you want to do in my life? God, uh, and all of us need to be praying this. God, dream your dreams through me the impossible. Dream your dreams through me. And that's where the promise comes. If you haven't received a promise, God, ask for that peace. God, give me peace so that I can receive my promise. Your promise. And second thing, God, is those who have not seen the promise fulfilled. God, would you encourage them? Would you encourage them? And we're going to sing a song. The Bible says that Jesus is interceding for us. And so Jesus is going to come by, by the Holy Spirit. And he's going to touch you that are here. He's going to speak a promise to you by the Holy Spirit. He's going to encourage you. And if different people feel led to say yes and amen to what the Holy Spirit's saying, you're free to come down and just lay hands on them. Probably put a mask on. But you can communicate. Yes and amen. Communicate. Since God's saying this. Remember, we're a church that we don't... None of us are on the sidelines. None of us are observers of the kingdom. We're all in. Amen? We are all in. So God, would you speak your promises? And would you bring your encouragement by the Spirit as we worship this song? And we say yes and amen to you.